Hello everyone, welcome to Identity3, Doc's podcast about decentralized identity. My name is Francisco and today I'm joined by Nick Lambert, CEO at Doc, and Mike Parkhill, Solutions Architect at Doc. And today I'm going to ask them all about authentication in the Web3 space. Nick, I wanted to start with you and ask you what is the status of Uh, authentication in Web2 and what are the problems that authentication in Web2 faced that led to some solutions showing up in Web3? Got it. Yeah, Francisco. Well, where we're at with um, authentication in Web2 is a, a situation where it's not terribly private or, or particularly secure. Um, so a kind of brief backstory is that we are, you know, when uh, we first started signing on to websites and things like that back in kind of Web1, we had a centralized identity where a website or a service, you would sign up with your email address and they would issue you um, an identifier, which you would then use to access their site. And the problem with that is we would all we'd all access multiple sites and we'd end up with a pretty long list of um, credentials for each of these sites. So uh, good for um, kind of siloing um, our privacy to that one um, service, uh, but terrible user experience. Um, so that improved when we moved to federated um, uh, authentication, whereby we used um, another um, services login credentials to access another system. So a great example of that would be something like login with Google uh, or login with Facebook. So what would be referred to by more technical people as OAuth. And so that was a great thing for user experience. We now could use um, you know, one set of credentials to access lots of different things. We didn't need to remember um, uh, separate logins for each an individual, uh, each uh, and every website. Uh, but the problem now is that um, the sites that we're logging in with, they can start to see where we are logging in, um, which when a lot of these companies like Google, Facebook and others are uh, kind of operating uh, an ad model, um, that erosion of privacy is, is pretty big. Um, and so we've uh, given up our privacy um, for the sake of convenience, as is often the case online. Um, so that's where we're at today. When the Web3 movement started, what other different authentication and authorization solutions showed up that uh, tried to solve these problems in Web2? Uh, well, quite recently, Francisco uh, sign in with Ethereum uh, came to fruition, um, which is uh, a real, a real good thing and a real step change over what we have today in Web 2. And so this would enable uh, users to create identifiers that they're already using for, you know, uh, DeFi and things like that, and to use their crypto wallets effectively to to log in to third party services. And this would give give them additional privacy um, over uh, kind of existing federated Web2 solutions. So, so really kind of positive news for for the Web3 world. And are, are there any sort of limitations that you see in connecting with a Ethereum wallet or a crypto wallet? Yeah, so as much as they're a good thing, uh, yeah, they're, they're not perfect. And so one of the, the limitations is that what developers uh, that use um, this as a, a method of authentication, sign in with Ethereum, um, is that they must use data that exists on the blockchain to verify that user uh, onto their system. And so, of course, um, that makes anything that you would use, they would want to verify a user with, uh, must be public. And so that's certainly a limitation um, of kind of signing with Ethereum and things like that. Okay, unless people start putting private data on the blockchain and that's a big no-no. Of course, and particularly a public blockchain as well, because of course, as we all know, blockchains, uh, certainly Ethereum, for example, is, is not encrypted and most blockchains are not. So you're basically would have all your, your private data as plain text on a, on a published blockchain, which is... Uh, kind of defeating the purpose of the whole thing, really. So Francisco, that's why we built Web3 ID. Um, so in, in essence, Web3 ID is a, a blockchain based um, authentication and authorization system uh, that really puts the user in control of the, the ability to, to log in to, to other systems. Um, so developers can use it to grant access and verify 
uh, users' el eligibility uh, by requesting uh, basically private data. So unlike Ethereum, the data being requested is not something that's on chain. Um, it would be something something else altogether and that the user would only provide this with their consent, which is a, a significant issue. Nick, th that's really interesting. And I, I want to bring Mike into the conversation to unpack uh, several of the things you just said. Uh, so Mike, I want to ask you first about the authentication side and then about the authorization side. How does a blockchain-based authentication system work? So there's a couple of perspectives. There's the developer perspective and the user perspective. So I'll start with the developer perspective. And for that, to integrate with uh, Docs signed in with Web3 ID, we're using OAuth, which is a, a well-known standard. It's the same thing that you're using when you do login with Google or login with Facebook. So if a developer is familiar with integrating with those systems, they should be able to integrate with the Web3 ID very, very quickly. So it's very, very simple from that perspective and using well-known standards. For authorization for the user, the user experience is Ultimately, they're scanning a QR code, um, but what details are they sharing back with the, the website is the decentralized identifier, or a DID, uh, which I'll probably call it a DID most of the rest of the way through this uh, for short form. But decentralized identifiers, DIDs, uh, they're an identity that is owned by the user. So it's created, it's stored on the blockchain. So that's the part that ties to the blockchain. That's what, how you know it's secure, how it's legitimate, all that. Uh, and it contains cryptographic keys, which are also very important for signing your messages, making it secure, proving that it's secure, that you own that identifier, all that kind of thing. But again, the key thing is the user owns it. So the user can generate their own decentralized identifier, their own did, store it in their wallet on their phone, and nobody else controls it, and they control who gets to see it and whoever has access to it. So when you go to sign in with Web3 ID, what you're doing is you're saying, I wanna sign into this website using this did, this identity that represents me. One of the cool things with that is you could have multiple. So if you wanted to have different personas for things like your social websites or your financial websites or your work events, whatever, you could have different personas for each of them. If you want to go all that way, you could actually create a different one for every single website. You mentioned that the DID is stored on the blockchain. What does the DID look like and what kind of information does it contain? Is there user information attached to it on the blockchain? There is nothing user identifiable uh, in the that did that's stored on the blockchain. It's a basically a really long string of alphanumeric characters. So a bunch of A's and B's and ones and twos and threes all mixed together. Um, they are not identifiable as to who they are. They're purely random as far as the users are concerned and very hard to track because of that. So you can't just say, hey, I see a did with these numbers and letters go, that must be Nick. It just isn't that, you can't do that. And so you mentioned one of the benefits of the IDs is that the user creates and owns the the keys the cryptographic keys uh that control these identifiers uh what other benefits are there in using decentralized identifiers so one of the things you get with being able to create multiple identities is the ability to prevent tracking or what's called correlation which is where someone who has visibility into multiple different websites um, and you can see that sometimes through things like google analytics sometimes data gets passed around so then if you use the same identity in multiple different websites and it was being tracked by Google Analytics or something like that, they might be able to start saying, oh, the same ID is being used here, here, and here. They still may not know who you are, but they can start drawing a picture of somebody doing various activities that are all linked together. Really interesting, Mike. So Nick also mentioned the authorization part and that privacy uh, is baked into Web3 ID. Could you explain to me how that authorization side works? So the authorization side in uh, the Web3 ID solution comes from the use of verifiable credentials, which again is another W3C standard uh, that we support. And, uh, and verifiable credentials are something that are held by the user again, and they're tied to one of those identifiers. So you'd get a, a credential that you know, might state how old you are or something like that, or where you live or anything like that. And that credential belongs to you, it's in your wallet on your phone, it's not owned by anybody else, no one else has access to it unless you give them access to it. So what that gives you is you can have multiple credentials for many things. You can have them based on age or your degree from university or whatever it might be. And then when you go sign into a website, the website owner could say, well, as long with your ident digital identifier, I need to know, do you have a certain credential or eligibility. So it could be something as simple as, are you over 18 to get into a gambling website or something like that? In which case they would ask for proof of age. So the way you do that is in our system, when you're prompted to sign in, you scan the QR code, it comes up and says, you must show a credential that shows you're over 18. So then 
the simple thing is we just say, okay, here's the credential, but then they would have access to that private data. They'd see your birth date or whatever, and you probably don't want that. So the next step is what's called the zero knowledge proof. So this is where what you do is you say this credential on my phone, it proves I'm over 18, but I'm not gonna share the credential, but I'm gonna share a cryptographic proof that backs up the fact that I have a credential that says I'm over 18. So then cryptography is used, and what's presented back to the developer ultimately is just, it's a cryptographic hash that when you sort of decompile it, all it really says is yes, there is absolute legitimate proof that this person is over 18. Okay, so the user stores their credentials in their non-custodial wallet, so uh, no user data is on the blockchain, but Correct. the developer or the organization can use the DID and the associated public key on the blockchain to verify that the data in the user's wallet is authentic. Is that it? That is it, yes. Yes, you summarized it nicely. Awesome, Mike, thank you. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask you now about how this technology can be used in uh, real world scenarios or even real world virtual scenarios. Uh, what, what do you see as the most interesting use cases where this technology can be applied? I think, uh, obviously, I mentioned the proof of age thing, which would be very useful for a lot of, you know, gambling or pornography or whatever sort of websites where there's age restrictions of where you can get to. Um, proof of location. So there's some things where you're only valid if you're in a certain jurisdiction. So you have to live in a certain country, whatever. Again, you could sort of say, yeah, you must prove you live in this country. Um, there's other financial ones, uh, which is also very interesting in the, the DeFi and crypto world is you know, say you need to prove you have a certain imbalance of uh, tokens. You can do you know, that kind of thing and prove, hey, yes, I've got you know, a thousand tokens or whatever in my wallet. So that makes me eligible to come in as to what the system is. Uh, so it's all those sorts of ones. Uh, another one that's interesting that we've heard about is the idea of being able to prove ownership of an NFT. So being able to actually have a verifiable credential saying that this, uh, this person controls this NFT. Uh, and so maybe that NFT is then used to allow you to have access into something in the metaverse or into another website or, or whatever. I know I've heard uh, some retail sites are now having special sale days where you need to have something to prove you can access the VIP sale section of the website or whatever like that. And that could be an NFT that you prove you control. Yeah, kind of actually adding into what like Mike's saying as well. And I mean, from a developer perspective, it's quite exciting as well because they can actually offer ta tailored experiences to users logging in who have different um, credentials um, who are proving different things. So in a DeFi platform or something like that, maybe doing decentralized kind of loans or something like that, um, users with um, that are able to prove um, kind of a lot of upward mobility, they have a lot of you know crypto stored in their wallets, they could actually see quite different offers than somebody who is um, less financially um, well off, for example. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, really enabling those the experiences to be tailored towards the user. So not only is that good for the user because they're potentially getting services that are much more relevant to them, but also great for developers as well who are able to, um, you know, uh, enhance the experience for each of their users and hopefully through doing that would make their, their services much more popular. As a recap, to see if I understood it correctly, so uh, basically a developer could get metaverse or real world experience based on private data. So at the moment we're recording this, uh, like the Playboy, I don't know if you read it, announced they are launching like a virtual mans a mansion in the sandbox metaverse. So I assume there's going to be some sort of or there will be, or should be, I don't know, age verification so that kids don't uh, are not allowed in. So this could be a case, right? Yeah, you would certainly hope that that would be as a parent as well. You would certainly hope that type of thing is um, uh, is kind of uh, age restricted, and certainly in that environment it would. Um, so yeah, you're exactly right, Francisco. You, you've summed that up well. I think the ability for verifying private data um, is, is the big thing that, that DocWeb 3ID can bring. Uh, and the use case you cited is a really good one. Another one might be something like gambling, uh, which, you know, different jurisdictions obviously have different um, approaches to, to, to the law. But certainly in the UK, over 18s um, are, uh, you know, permitted to gamble. And so having um, those restrictions put in place 
and using credentials to, to bypass them is certainly uh, another great use case for the technology. So an another really interesting one that you mentioned is the ability to prove that you have a certain amount or at least a certain amount of tokens without disclosing the entire wallet balance, uh, right? Uh, and I remember some NFT uh, mints uh, or like to enter the whitelist users have to, and I, I think NFT projects do this to, to limit the number of bots um, that get into whitelist. So users have to prove they have a minimum a wallet balance. But of course, if you're sharing your wallet address, you're also sharing whatever else you have inside your wallet. Yeah, absolutely. There's certainly people out there that we all see online that boast about having you know, billions of dollars of crypto um, and are often uh, doing so uh, incorrectly. But I think, yeah, for the most part, there are, there are many out there that would not want to disclose what is effectively quite private information. Um, and again, being able to verify information privately um, would would another be another great fit for that? And yes, you could. It's a really nice way, actually. The use case you described of um, kind of limiting bots, um, who obviously somebody you know running lots of bots wouldn't want to necessarily have you know huge values of of crypto stored in their wallets. It would make the attack extremely expensive. And so having a way to limit that is a really smart use of it as well. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I feel I learned a lot about Web3 authentication and authorization. And I think that's the episode. Thank you. Thanks, Francisco. Thank you.